Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here and you're someone who enjoys listening to horror stories, join us by clicking subscribe down below. I upload every single night brand new horror stories. Let's begin. Okay, so picture this. Me, Chloe, a freshman at state, stuck in this totally boring, quiet neighborhood. Like seriously, it's the kind of place where squirrels have tea parties and old ladies gossip about what kind of fertilizer they're using on their petunias. My room is tiny, the rent is killer, but hey, it's close to campus. The only thing with this Mrs. Henderson, my landlady, was that she was such a sweet old lady, with a million stories about her grandkids, and the time she accidentally dyed her cat purple. But Mrs. Henderson kind of scared me sometimes. Whenever she looked at me, it was like she was seeing straight through me, you know? And she'd always ask me about my plans for the future, which was creepy, because I didn't even know what I wanted to do with my life. Anyway, one night, I was studying in my room, which was basically a closet with a desk, when I heard this weird humming coming from downstairs. It was like some kind of chanting, and it was getting louder and louder. I looked outside my window, and saw the Henderson house was dark except for one light in the basement. Now, my curiosity got the better of me. I had seen Mrs. Henderson come and go from the basement with several other people from the neighborhood, all looking really, really serious. I know you're probably thinking, Chloe, that's totally weird, and you should have minded your own business. But hey, this is a story, right? and I had to know what was going on. So, I snuck out my window, which was literally the only window in my room that wasn't nailed shut, and tiptoed through the garden. I carefully pushed open the basement door, my heart pounding like a drum solo. The room was dimly lit by a single flickering lamp, and a circle of people stood around a dusty old table, covered in what looked like, wait for it, sacrificial stuff. There was a bowl of blood. Seriously? Blood. Some candles, a bunch of weird symbols drawn on the floor, and a big, creepy-looking book with pages that looked like they were made out of human skin. I had this sudden urge to puke. The weird chanting started again, and I saw Mrs. Henderson, looking a lot less sweet old lady, and a lot more like some kind of a witch leading the group. She picked up a knife, the one they used to prepare the Thanksgiving turkey, and I swear I saw a flicker of something evil in her eyes. She dropped the knife into the bowl of blood, and started reciting some words in a language I didn't even recognize, but the way she said them, it made chills run down my spine. As Mrs. Henderson chanted, the other people in the circle started moving in a weird hypnotic way, like they were all possessed. They were muttering some stuff too, but it was all garbled and creepy. The only words I could make out were packed and blood. Then, Mrs. Henderson picked up the big creepy book, opened it, and dipped her finger into the blood. I held my breath afraid to look. She started writing something in the book, and the chanting became even louder, like it was echoing through the entire neighborhood. I was about to leave, convinced I had witnessed enough, but Mrs. Henderson looked up. Her eyes were bloodshot, her face was contorted into a terrifying smile, and she stared straight at me. It was like she knew I was there the whole time. I froze, not really sure what to do. Then, I noticed that she started walking towards me. 
the knife still dripping with blood in her hand. I was terrified, and before I could think straight, I did something stupid. I turned and ran for my life. I ran through the garden, practically tripping over the rose bushes. I scrambled over the fence and ended up in my own backyard. I ran back to my room, slammed the window shut and locked it, my breathing ragged, my pulse still racing. The experience was totally disturbing, but it also made me strangely curious. Who were these people in the basement, and what were they doing there? It was like a scene from a horror movie, the kind where the bad guy is the unassuming old lady next door. The more I thought about it, the more confused I got. What was the deal with the blood, the chanting, the book, and what was that strange look Mrs. Henderson gave me? I couldn't just ignore it. I had to find out what was going on, and maybe, just maybe, I would finally understand what was up with the residents of this seemingly normal but increasingly weird neighborhood. I gave notice to Mrs. Henderson, left that place and rented somewhere a couple miles down the road. I never heard or saw from her ever again, and to be quite honest with you, I don't want to. The first sign something was wrong was the silence. Not the quiet noise of a suburban life, but the kind of silence that makes you think the fridge is broken. But the kind that makes you peek over the fence and check for smoke rising from your neighbor's chimney. My neighbor, bless her heart, was a baking fanatic. Every Sunday morning, the aroma of cinnamon rolls would waft into my kitchen, a sweet siren call to the coffee pot and the newspaper. But this Sunday, the air hung heavy with the scent of unanswered questions. It wasn't just the lack of cinnamon though. My neighbor, usually meticulously pruned her rose bushes, but now they were a tangle of thorns and wilting blooms. Her porch swing, a constant rhythm in the warm summer nights, swayed listlessly. The Eldridges were a classic couple, the kind you see in those sitcoms that are set in the wrong decade. Mr. Eldridge, a stocky man with a booming laugh that always seemed to be on the verge of a cough, was a retired accountant the sort of man who could balance a checkbook with a blindfold on Mrs. Eldridge, a slender woman with sharp wit and a penchant for floral print dresses. She was a retired teacher, the sort of woman who could quote Shakespeare while arguing about the price of eggs at the grocery store. They were, in their own sweet way, the picture of domestic bliss. Or so it seemed. The argument started with the usual suspect, their daughter Amelia, and her latest attempt to make a career out of being an artist. Mr. Eldridge, a man of practicality and spreadsheets, couldn't understand why she had tried to get into acrylic paints and canvases, while Mrs. Eldridge, a woman who believed in the beauty, defended Amelia. I was sitting on my porch swing, listening to the squabble unfold through the open window. I was a silent observer to what was going on. It was only when Mrs. Eldridge's voice rose, shrill with anger, that I thought something was seriously wrong here. I knew them well enough to recognize that kind of fury, the kind that boiled beneath the surface, threatening to erupt. Then, silence. The only sound left was the whirling of the air conditioning, 
a monotonous hum that seemed to mock the abrupt stillness. I waited, heart pounding a nervous tattoo against my ribs, for the familiar patter of Mrs. Eldridge's footsteps on the porch. A few days passed, and the silence just remained, broken only by the occasional cough of Mr. Eldridge's booming laugh, a sound that now carried a hollow echo in its wake. The police were called, naturally, but their investigation yielded nothing. The house, a picture of perfect suburban serenity, offered no clues to Mrs. Eldridge's whereabouts. The neighbours, also, had no idea of the sudden disappearance. They simply offered theories, each more improbable than the last, but none provided any answers. Even the disappearance of Mrs. Eldridge's beloved corgi, Pippin, seemed to confirm the growing sense of dread. The small scruffy dog, usually an inseparable companion, vanished as if swallowed by the very air itself. I, however, had my own theory, a little kernel of suspicion that grew into a full-blown conspiracy in my mind. It was a theory that danced on the edge of logic, a twisted puzzle that refused to be solved. It all started with a conversation I overheard, a snippet of Mr. Eldridge's voice on the phone, a frantic plea laced with fear. He mentioned something about a mistake, a miscalculation, and a hiding place. It wasn't enough to go on, I did tell the police but it was enough to set my imagination spinning. I watched Mr. Eldridge. He was an actor on stage, and the script had been torn to shreds. I saw him burying the rose bushes, their blooms drooping like mourning doves. He was burying the memories of his wife, her laughter, her gentle touch. I saw him in the dead of night, dragging a shovel across the newly turned earth of his garden. The only sound was the crunch of gravel. Then I saw him, that night, standing before the window of his bedroom, a figure in the darkness. His eyes looked bad, like he hadn't slept in weeks. The authorities, of course, never found anything. The disappearance of Mrs. Eldridge remained a mystery a ghost story whispered in hushed tones between neighbours, a nagging doubt that lingered in the air like the scent of wilting roses. But I knew, I knew the silence held a secret, a secret that lay buried beneath that rose bush, a secret that would forever be in the shadows of my memory. This is the story of Mrs. Eldridge, a story that began with the silence of a Sunday morning, a silence that swallowed her whole, a silence that would never be broken, a silence that whispered the truth, a secret that lived in the shadows, a secret that I would carry with me, a secret that belonged to the dead, and a secret that belonged to the wind. And I, the silent observer, the bearer of a truth too terrible to speak, or, unlegal, the keeper of a secret buried deep beneath the soil. The story ends here. Remember, this is the story written with the focus making the reader believe that I know something. But legally speaking, I cannot comment any further. It's a story of a man who is likely coping with a difficult situation in a way that's harmful, even though we're led to believe he did something terrible, it's important to remember that this is just a theory, and perhaps he really was just burying the rosebush at two in the morning.
Okay, so this is going to be a long one, but I swear it's worth it. It's about my neighbour who we'll call Bob. You know, Bob from next door. The guy who's always got his head under the hood of some car, tinkering away like a mad scientist. Yeah, him. Well, Bob, he's been like that since I was a little kid. I remember once, I was like eight years old, and I was playing in the backyard. I was building a fort out of blankets and chairs, you know, the kind of fort that could only exist in the imagination of an eight-year-old. And then I heard this loud bang. It sounded like something had exploded. Anyways, I ran over to Bob's yard and there he was, under the hood of his old Chevy, covered in grease. He had taken the engine apart, and for some reason, he had a whole bunch of wrenches and screwdrivers in his mouth. It was kind of creepy, but also kind of funny. Bob, you see, he's always been like that. He's got this thing about cars, you know. Like it's not just a hobby. It's like a whole way of life. He could name every car model made in the last 50 years. He knows all the parts, their history, how to fix them, everything. It's incredible. Plus, he always has a new car project going on, a new engine to rebuild, or a rusty old classic to restore. And you can bet your bottom dollar that he'll be in the garage working on it, even when it's raining cats and dogs outside. Now, a few months ago, something happened. Bob, who always has a million different cars in his garage, bought a brand new Ford Mustang. Oh boy, he was excited. I mean, he used to talk about this car all the time, like it was some kind of a dream. And now it was in his driveway, shiny and red and beautiful. He was ecstatic. He spent every weekend cleaning it, polishing it and waxing it. I swear he was sleeping with that car at night. He'd be out there in his garage, under the lights late into the night, tinkering with it, making sure everything was perfect. Honestly, it felt like Bob only had one thing on his mind. It was like the Mustang had become his whole world. He'd race up and down the street in it, revving the engine and making everyone jump. He'd be telling everyone about it, showing it off, and, well, let's just say... It was kind of obnoxious. The thing is, Bob, he was really, really loving that car. You know, not just loving it, but he loved it. It was more than just a car to him. It was like his other half, and he wanted everyone to know that. He'd tell me about it, every little detail of the car, like it was some kind of a sacred text. He'd show me the engine compartment, the sleek curves of the body, the shiny leather seats. He had described the engine's roar, the way the car handled, and the way it felt to drive. But here's the thing, it was like, obsessive. He just kept talking and talking and talking about that car. It was all that he could think about. He'd talk about cars at breakfast, dinner, and even when we were just watching TV round their house. I gotta say, it was kind of hard to keep up with all the car talk. Sometimes I'd just zone out and look at my phone while my parents kept talking to him or pretended to listen. But I knew Bob was so excited, so I just tried to be a good neighbour and pretended like I was interested. Okay, you're probably wondering where this is actually going and how this relates at all to any form of horror story. Well, all jokes aside, one day, I woke up to the sound of sirens outside. I walked over to the window and saw a whole bunch of ambulances and even police cars. It was chaos. Then I saw the Mustang. It was mangled against a house opposite ours, crumpled like a piece of paper. Me and my family ran outside, our hearts pounding. There were police officers everywhere. Then I saw Bob's wife, Ellen, standing there, 
her face pale. She was shaking. She turned to me and her eyes were filled with tears. It was an accident, she said. He was speeding down. Lost control. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. A few months ago, he was so excited about this car, so proud of it, and now, it was gone. Bob was gone. They said that he lost control of the car, veered off the road after pumping the accelerator, hitting the gas in the neighborhood street. Yes, a dumb idea. But, he lost control, skidded out and collided with one of the houses. They said that he was going too fast, the road was wet, and the rest, well, the rest was history. It was all so sudden, so senseless. The whole neighborhood was shocked. People kept coming up to Ellen and me, sharing their condolences and telling stories about Bob. They all talked about how much he loved his cars. They talked about how he'd always be there to help anyone fix their car. How he'd always have a tool in his hand. His garage is still full of projects, half finished, waiting for him to come back and work on them. But he won't be coming back. And the car, the brand new red Mustang that he loves so much, it's gone too, written off, just like him. Sometimes I still catch myself thinking about Bob every once in a while. My mind goes back to that day. I hear the sirens, see the mangled car, and the look on Ellen's face. It's like watching a movie over and over again. I wish things could be different. I wish Bob was still here, in his garage, working on his cars, talking about engines and gear ratios. I wish we could still hear that familiar sound of his engine revving just one more time. But that's not how life works, I guess. And now, every time I see a car zoom past, I think of Bob, and I remember that life can be so fragile, you never know what's going to happen next. So I guess the lesson here is, you gotta enjoy life while you can, you gotta love the things that make you happy, but you gotta do it without going overboard, keep a sane mind, You've got to be careful, because life, it's just too short. There's no way Bob was expecting that to happen. It was a simple pull gone wrong. The rain hammered against the window pane. It was a kind of relentless downpour that made you want to bury yourself under the duvet and forget that the world even existed. But I couldn't. I was trapped, drowning in the claustrophobic reality of my new life in Blackburn, UK. I had moved from the south coast of Dorset, where life was a gentle breeze and the biggest worry was whether the seagulls would snag your chips off the pier. Now, I was in the heart of Lancashire, the drizzle a constant companion, and my only consolation, the ever-present smell of fish and chips wafting from the local chippy. My parents, bless their old souls, had been growing increasingly frail. Dad, a retired shipbuilder, used to be a giant of a man, his hands calloused and strong from years of shaping steel. My mum, a former receptionist at a fancy hotel, was a whippet of a woman, always impeccably dressed. But time, like a relentless tide, had washed away their vibrant energy, leaving them fragile and slightly vulnerable. Moving up north was a necessity for me, a way to be closer, to offer practical support, but it came at a price. I had traded the breezy seaside life for a cramped, damp flat in a building that looked like it had seen better days. The rent was extortionate, 
at £1,100 a month. The place was barely big enough for me, let alone my cat, who seemed to be permanently stuck in a state of existential crisis. The walls were thin, the plaster was cracked, and the bathroom, a tiny cubicle, perpetually reeking of mould. The highlight of that flat was the mould clinging to the ceiling in the living room. I'd tried to complain to the landlord, but five weeks later, the only reply I got was a, no one's replying. Across the hallway lived a woman, elderly and frail. She was always shuffling in the hallway, guided by a long stick with the white balls at the end. She never talked, only gave me a smile with the faintest hint of yellow teeth. I always felt a prickle of unease when I saw her. The sheet stillness of her gaze, her unblinking stare. I did my best to avoid her, hoping that she wouldn't notice my existence. One Friday night, after a particularly bad day at work, I went out for drinks with my colleagues. It was a typical Friday night, loud music, cheap cocktails and lots of laughter and gossip. The drinks flowed and the mood grew more boisterous. Soon I was laughing with the best of them. We stumbled out of the club, the cold air hitting us like a punch in the face. I was still high on the fumes of the night, my head buzzing with the noise of the pub and the chatter of my colleagues. My flat felt like a million miles away. I remember vaguely promising to call a cab, but the club had me in its spell, its warm lights and the scent of stale beer, a siren's call. When I finally made it back to my flat, it was way after midnight. The usual quiet had descended, broken only by the relentless rhythm of the rain. I fumbled my keys, a triumph smile spreading across my face as I clocked the law open. Right, just gotta get to the couch, I mumbled, kicking the door shut. I was too drunk to even remember locking the door. It seemed like a good idea at the time, a glorious alcohol-induced decision. I collapsed onto the couch, my clothes still damp from the rain and sweat, and then drifted off to sleep, almost immediately. Two hours later, I was jolted awake. The flat was pitch black, and the only light coming from the faint glow of the street lamps outside. Something was wrong. Minchkin? My voice sounded hoarse and unfamiliar. Minchkin? I was wondering if it was my cat. I called out for her. She wasn't answering. My hand instinctively went for the switch as I got up, but my fingers brushed against emptiness. I couldn't find the switch, and I felt like I was losing my mind. Shit, I muttered. I felt a sudden wave of panic wash over me. I grabbed my phone, but it was dead. As I lay there, my eyes adjusting to the darkness, I heard a sound. A scratching sound coming from the hallway outside my door. It was a soft, hesitant scratching, like someone was trying to get my attention. It was the old woman the one with the white stick who was blind. Why would she be trying to get into my flat? What on earth was going on? The scratching stopped, replaced by a faint rustling sound. Then, I remember hearing the door handle turn, and the door creaking open. I sat up, my heart pounding in my chest. Hello? Who's there? A figure stumbled into the room, her white stick tapping the floor in a nervous rhythm. Oh, thank heavens, I've lost my way, the old woman said. She was facing me, but she seemed to be looking past me. Her eyes were distant and completely vacant. What are you doing in my flat? I said. 
It's the middle of the night. This is my home? The old woman blinked slowly, a confused expression passing over her face. Home? Is this my home? I don't remember. Her voice trailed off. Her eyes were completely out of it. I felt bad for her, but my heart was still jumping out my chest, and I felt like I was about to have a heart attack from panic. Of course, this isn't your home. It's mine. Don't you know where you live? I snapped, the alcohol still having not worn off. I don't remember, she said. A wave of nausea swept over me. The woman was clearly disorientated, maybe even suffering from dementia, but that didn't explain why she was shuffling into my apartment in the middle of the night when most people would be asleep. She took a step towards me, her stick tapping against the floor, making a sound that echoed in the silent flat. Suddenly, I saw her eyes flick down to Minchkin, who had woken up from his slumber. Her eyes green, reflecting the pale moonlight. Kitty, 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 she said, her voice croaking whisper. Pretty kitty, pretty kitty. I jumped to my feet, grabbing a pillow from the couch as a makeshift weapon. Don't touch him, I yelled. Stay away. The old woman took a step back. Her expression, yeah, she looked scared. She dropped her stick and her hands were shaking slightly. You're scaring me. I'm lost. I was overreacting and the alcohol was 100% to blame. I stared at her, my anger fading as I dropped the pillow back onto the couch. I had stumbled upon something I couldn't understand. This woman had been creeping me out ever since I moved in. But now, in the middle of the night in my own flat, she had bought a new level of fear. Listen, you need to go back to your apartment. I'll help you. I was terrified, but I couldn't let my fear paralyze me. My apartment? What apartment? I guided her towards the door, my hands hovering over the throw pillow, a strange mixture of fear and pity washing over me. It's right across the hall, see? I said, pointing towards the door. Oh, she said, her voice a tired sigh. She stumbled towards the door, her stick lying on forgotten on the floor. I watched her go. As soon as she disappeared down the hallway, I slammed the door shut, locking it with shaking hands. I stood there leaning against the door, my breath catching in my throat. I had never felt so scared in my life, so exposed, over a blind old woman. That night I couldn't sleep. I tried to rationalize what had happened. I had had a few too many drinks. My mind had played a trick on me. I was tired, stressed, and missing the calm of my old life down south. It was just an old woman lost and confused. There was nothing to be afraid of. But as I lie awake, the scratching sound from the hallway, the woman's terrified eyes, the unsettling sensation of her cold hand brushing against mine, it replayed in my mind like a broken record. Deep down, a tiny voice, a seed of doubt, whispered, It wasn't just a trick on your mind. She was real. And she was scared. From that night on, I could never look at the old woman in the same way. Her silence, her emptiness, held a new kind of terror, a hint of darkness that never quite went away. I wouldn't say her appearance was a regular occurrence, more like a spectral shadow that appeared once a week, returning once or twice a month. She started leaving things, things that would end up in my flat, a single yellow glove left near the door, like a calling card of misfortune. Sometimes I would find her outside my door, seemingly lost, but with a haunted smile plastered on her face. The dread of seeing her, 
her vacant eyes staring into my soul, would send a shiver through my body. As the months passed by, my world in Blackburn began to feel more and more like a waking nightmare. I longed for the days of Dorset, for the friendly faces and the comforting rhythm of the sea. Blackburn was a city of shadows, a place where the past lingered in the fog, and the present was haunted by a sense of impending doom. And as for the old woman across the hallway, she would always be there. I don't like her, but I will help her if she needs it. It's okay, I'm not that horrible. Okay, so picture this. It's a Wednesday. You know, just a regular run-of-the-mill Wednesday. I'm in my apartment trying to get ready to head out for work. I've got my coffee brewing, my favorite playlist blasting, and I'm simultaneously trying to find my damn keys, which have a knack for disappearing in the black hole that is my purse. My life is a symphony of chaos, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm in the middle of a hair-pulling struggle with my mascara when I hear a knock on the door. I think it's probably the pizza delivery guy, even though I didn't order pizza. My roommate Shannon has a serious pizza addiction. It's one of her many quirks. I'm just too tired to be dealing with her shenanigans at 7am. I glance at the peephole. It's not the pizza guy. Thank God. It's, well, it's that guy. Yeah, that guy. The one who moved into the apartment across from mine. I swear, dude never leaves his apartment. So, you're probably wondering why I call him that guy. Well, there's this whole story. It starts with me moving into this apartment complex, thinking I was gonna have the best time of my life. You know, meeting new people, having a blast, maybe even finding a cute guy who wasn't a total loser. But it turns out, that's not how things work. Especially when you're stuck living across from the creepiest dude you've ever met in your life. It all started when I moved in, and I saw him loading his stuff into his truck. He just gave me a creepy smile. You know, that tight-lipped smile that's not a smile. He was driving this beat-up Ford Ranger, all dusty and covered in stickers, and his hair? Well, let's just say it wasn't a bad hair day. It was a week-long bad hair catastrophe. He looked like he'd just woken up from a coma after a month-long bender. The thing is, he never comes out. Like, ever. I'm not talking about him being an introvert who avoids social interaction. This guy is a hermit. A recluse. A freaking mystery. The only time I ever saw him was when he took his trash out late at night, and it was like he was trying to avoid any human contact. So, back to the knock on my door. I'm just standing there, mascara smudged all over my face, hair in a messy bun, and my heart is thumping. I peek through the peephole and my eyes lock with his. It's like he can see right through me. He just stands there, staring at me with this blank expression. I can't read the guy for nothing. I do the first thing that comes to mind. I slam the door shut and bolt my dead bulk. That's when I feel this chill run down my spine. I swear, I heard a chuckle through the door. Like he knew he'd scare me. A shiver crawls up my arm and my body is puzzling with adrenaline. I grab my phone and call Shannon. 
trying to pretend I'm not freaking out. Hey, where's the pizza? I asked, trying to sound normal. My mind is racing. Did I just see a ghost? Did I leave the stove on? What's happening? Shannon's voice comes through the phone. Dude, I haven't even left the house. Are you alright? Yeah, yeah. Totally fine, I say, trying to steady my voice. Just wondering when the pizza was gonna get here. I hang up before she can ask any more questions. I'm not ready to tell her what happened. I tell myself I'm just being irrational, that it's all in my head. I brush off the encounter as one of those things that just happened in your life. It's not like it was the first weird thing that happened to me, right? But the next time I see him, my mind is racing again. I'm at Walmart, trying to grab a few groceries after work. I'm trying to choose between the organic spinach and the regular spinach. Seriously, what's the difference? But I bump into him. Okay, that's a lie. I didn't actually bump into him. I saw him out of the corner of my eye, walking slowly down the aisle. It was like he was trying to keep a safe distance, but was also watching me. I grabbed my sister Tiffany, who's just staring at me with wide eyes. Tiffany, we gotta go now, I say grabbing her hand and pulling her along. What the hell? Tiffany yells. What's wrong with you? She asks. That guy was just getting groceries too. Just shut up and come on, I say, practically dragging her out of the aisle. This guy is still walking a couple of aisles over, and I feel like he's looking at me. I know this sounds crazy, but I'm practically sprinting down the aisle trying to get away from him. What the heck is going on? Tiffany asks, confused. I'm too panicked to explain. I just push my way through the crowds and we make a run for it. We're both out of breath and we stop at the entrance of the store, leaning against the wall. Tiffany is about to ask what the heck happened, but I stop her. Don't even ask, I tell her. We gotta go, now. The whole car ride home is silent. Tiffany keeps giving me side eye because I won't tell her what's going on. I can't explain it to her. I don't even understand it myself. This whole situation freaked me out. I was staying up at night, checking the windows, calling my friends to come over and stay with me. My paranoia was at an all-time high. The worst part? I couldn't prove anything. I mean, what could I do? I can't just tell the landlord, hey, the guy across the hall is totally creeping me out. I'm thinking I was probably just overreacting. That guy was, after all, just a regular dude. But the thought of being in that apartment alone, not knowing what he was doing, it was making me feel crazy. That's when I decided to move back in with my parents. It's not exactly glamorous, but it's my safe space for now. I spend most of my days watching movies and catching up with old friends. Sometimes I think I'm losing my mind, but then my mom brings me a plate of cookies and reminds me that everything's going to be okay. I hate to admit it, but it's nice to be home. My parents are a little overprotective, especially my dad, but their love is unconditional. It's a welcome change from the constant anxiety I was feeling. I still haven't told my parents what's going on. They'd probably think I'm nuts, and I can't blame them. It's all so bizarre and hard to explain. Sometimes, I tell myself I'll go back to the apartment, and if that creep is still there, I'll confront them, but then I realize I don't have the guts. I'm not a tough chick. I'm a scaredy cat who just wants to stay safe and away from creepy people. So right now, I'm just playing it safe, avoiding the old apartment, and trying to distance myself from the whole situation. It's probably a good thing I don't live there anymore.
I can't imagine dealing with the constant thought that that guy might be watching me. I'll probably never know what he was thinking or what his intentions were, but I'll never forget the unsettling feeling I got from the whole experience. Some things are better left unexplained. I guess it's a good thing that I didn't get into any real trouble. After all, you can't be afraid of every creepy person. But I'll tell you this, I'm never living across from a guy who looks like a zombie ever again. It's just not healthy for anyone's sanity. And sometimes, you just have to know when to run and just call it a game over. Allow me to introduce my neighbor, Boris, an eccentric soul whose unparalleled capacity for misadventure would rival that of a Keystone Cops reunion. We've known each other since we were wee rugrats, running amok in the cul-de-sac, our youthful antics leaving a trail of laughter in broken bones, mostly Boris's. On this particular afternoon, as I toiled diligently over my European history textbook, the tranquility of my bedroom was shattered by a cataclysmic metal crash. A symphony of curses and profanities echoed through the air, mingling with the deafening clang of falling metal. I rushed to my window, my heart pounding in my chest, expecting to witness a scene of abject carnage. To my astonishment, there was Boris, sprawled out on the driveway like a beached whale, his legs contorted at unnatural angles, the ladder that had once propelled him to dizzying heights now lay crumpled beside him, a testament to the relentless laws of physics. Bollocks! Boris exclaimed as I rushed to his side. I've bloody snapped me legs, you daft bugger! Amidst the pain and bewilderment, I couldn't help but chuckle at the absurdity of it all. Boris, you absolute plonker! How did you manage to do that? I was painting the damn guttering, you see, and the ladder was a bit wobbly, like a drunk giraffe, and then I slipped and next thing I know, I'm down here with me legs all buggered up. As paramedics rushed to his aid, I couldn't shake the image of Boris, the bumbling fool, his misadventures forever imprinted on my mind. For the next four months, he languished in a wheelchair, a constant reminder of the perils of DIY and the indomitable spirit that kept him going through it all. One evening, as I was visiting him in his wheelchair accessible hovel, Boris recounted the tale with a wry grin. You know what the worst part was? He wheezed. The nurses kept asking me if I was a bloody builder, like I was some kind of incompetent oik. I mean, I've got a degree in quantum physics. For Christ's sake, I couldn't help but burst into laughter. Oh, Boris, you're a piece of work, but at least you've got a good story out of it. And so the legend of Boris, the latter falling neighbor, lived on, a tale whispered among our circle of friends with a mixture of amusement and sympathy. It became a reminder that even in the mundane tasks of life, humor could be found in the most unexpected of places. And as the years went by, Boris's legs healed, but his capacity for mishaps never waned. One day, he managed to set fire to his kitchen 
while attempting to make Yorkshire puddings. Another time, he accidentally invited his mother-in-law to his own birthday party. But through it all, he remained the same lovable, accident-prone neighbor I'd known since we were six years old. And I, his loyal witness to his countless adventures, could never resist a chuckle whenever I saw him. A grin spread across his face, always ready to share the latest tale of his misadventures. For in the tapestry of life, it's the imperfect threads that add the most vibrant colors. And Boris, with his knack for finding trouble, was an eternal source of amusement and laughter. The first sign of trouble came with the slam of the car door. I was in the middle of a particularly heated chess match with Mrs. Henderson, our building's resident cat lady, when that unmistakable sound echoed through the hallway. It was followed by a screech, the kind that makes your teeth ache, and a string of obscenities I wouldn't repeat to a sailor. Sounds like the Johnsons again, Mrs. Henderson said. Her green eyes narrowed as she maneuvered her queen into a checkmate position, a smug grin spreading across her face. They do it every day, I mumbled, resigning myself to another round of their daily drama. The Johnsons had moved in a few months ago. He, Mr. Johnson, was a tall, thin man with a perpetually furrowed brow and a voice that could shatter glass. She, Mrs. Johnson, was a woman of a more compact build, her hair a riot of red curls, permanently bristling with indignation. They were, to put it mildly, a volatile couple. The arguments usually started around dinner time. It began with a low rumble, a mumble between the closed door and the wall, and quickly escalated into a hurricane of accusations, threats, and slammed cabinets. It was always the same. They would start with a mundane disagreement, like whose turn it was to take out the trash, or a misplaced remote, and somehow it would transform into a full-blown brawl. That night, the argument focused on the thermostat. I told you to turn it down, Mrs. Johnson shrieked. It's freezing in here. I don't need to listen to your every whim, Mr. Johnson retorted, his voice thick with anger. It's my apartment too. A chilling silence followed, punctuated by a series of thumps and a crash. The entire building seemed to hold its breath. I glanced at Mrs. Henderson, who was watching the wall with a stoic expression. They'll be fine, she said eventually. They always are. But I couldn't help but feel uneasy. It was getting worse by the day. And the shouting? It seemed to be louder, more vicious. Day two. The screaming started earlier today. I was trying to work, the rhythm of my typing disrupted by the constant barrage of insults. You useless excuse for a husband? Mrs. Johnson shrieked. You haven't held a job in years. You're the one who's useless, Mr. Johnson roared, spending all our money on your fancy clothes and your ridiculous cat hair removal sessions. The sound of a vase smashing against the wall sent a shiver down my spine. This time, it went on longer than usual. The silence after the shouting was heavy with the tension that made the hairs on the back of my neck 
stand on end. I couldn't take it anymore. I grabbed my phone and dialed the non-emergency line. Hello, I'm calling to report a domestic disturbance. I began, my voice trembling. But before I could finish, the phone went dead. I didn't know why, but I felt a sudden urge to check on them. Grasping the doorknob, I steeled myself and knocked, hesitantly at first, then more urgently when there was no answer. The door stood ajar. I pushed it open, my heart pounding in my chest. The apartment was a disaster. Furniture overturned, dishes scattered on the floor, but there was no sign of the Johnsons. I called out their names, but only met with silence. I finally found them huddled in the back corner of the apartment, their backs against the wall. They looked pale and shaking, their eyes wide with fear. What happened? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. They just stared at me, speechless. Are you all right? I asked again, moving closer. Mr. Johnson finally spoke, his voice barely audible. The pipes, they burst. The apartment reeked of water damage, the smell thick and heavy in the air. The pipes had indeed burst, sending a cascade of water gushing from the ceiling. I could see the fear in their eyes, the fear of not just the flood, but of something more, a fear that I couldn't grasp. Day three. Today was quiet. The Johnsons secluded in their apartment. The only sounds coming from the hum of the dehumidifiers and the occasional muffled sob. I spent most of the day staring at the wall, picturing what happened. Was it a fight that had escalated? A struggle that ended with the pipes bursting? Or was it something else? Entirely something darker? Something they were trying to hide? The silence felt heavier than the noise, carrying with it the unspoken tension between them, the raw emotions they were desperately trying to conceal. Day four. The tension in the apartment building was palpable, an invisible force pushing against us. We all knew what happened, even if we didn't say it out loud. The rumors were flowing like the water that had flooded the Johnson's apartment. We whispered about them in the hallway, the elevator, the laundry room. I heard they were fighting about money. It's the stress, I bet. They'll be out of here soon, I'm sure. But the whispers were laced with fear. A fear fueled by the unknown, by the dark secrets hidden behind their closed doors. Day 5. The banging started before dawn. It was a rhythmic pounding, constant and relentless, that seemed to shake the very foundations of the building. I stumbled out of my bed, my heart thudding against my ribs like a trapped bird. It was coming from the Johnson's apartment, a frantic pounding that echoed through the hallway, each beat like a hammer blow to my sanity. When the pounding finally stopped, I heard Mr. Johnson's voice, low and guttural, a voice I had never heard before. Let me out! Let me out! He screamed. The fear I felt was primal, raw, an unsettling sensation that curled around me like a suffocating blanket. I knew I had to do something. But what? I couldn't just stand there, listening to him plead, his voice laced with desperation and fear. I slowly opened my door, my hand trembling on the knob. I tiptoed along the hallway, my eyes locked on the Johnson's apartment door, the beating of my heart a steady drum against my ears. As I moved closer, the sounds from within became more distinct. I could hear Mrs. Johnson's voice, raised and sharp, 
intermingled with Mr. Johnson's cries. I could hear the sounds of struggle, the desperate pounding of fists against wood. My hand reached out to the doorknob, my fingers hesitant, unwilling to push it open, but driven by a sense of urgency I couldn't ignore. Then I heard it, the snap of a gunshot, followed by a deafening silence that seemed to swallow the world whole. My hand froze. My mind went black. I stood there, frozen in place, the weight of the world pressing down on me. Every instinct in me screamed at me to run, to hide, but I stood rooted to the spot, my body petrified by a combination of fear and morbid curiosity. My hand, shaking uncontrollably, reached out to the doorknob. I took a deep breath and pushed it open, bracing myself for whatever horror awaited me on the other side. Day six. The police arrived shortly after I called. They found Mrs. Johnson lying on the floor, a single bullet wound in her chest. Mr. Johnson was nowhere to be found. They questioned me for hours, their questions probing their eyes searching for a clue, a hidden truth I might be concealing. I told them what I knew, the screaming, the fighting, the pipes bursting. I told them about the fear in their eyes, the desperation in their voices, the darkness that I sensed lurking beneath the surface of their normal lives. But they didn't believe me. They saw only a couple who had fought one too many times, a tragedy born out of a long, simmering resentment. They left my apartment, their footsteps heavy, their presence a dark cloud that lingered in the air. I sat on the edge of my bed, watching the empty hallway, the silent echo of the gunshot ringing in my ears. I thought about the Johnsons, their lives, their struggles, their secrets. I thought about myself, the fear that had gripped me, the horror that I had witnessed, the silence that had been broken by a sound of a gunshot. I was trapped in an echo chamber, the walls closing in on me, filled with the whispers of the past the shadows of what had been, and I knew with a chilling certainty that this was just the beginning. The truth was out there, hidden in the shadows, waiting to be revealed. Day 7, I woke up to the news on the radio. Mr. Johnson found dead near the river, the reporter said, his voice clipped and emotionless. Police suspect suicide. The words hit me with a force that sent a wave of nausea through my body. I felt a strange sense of emptiness, a hollow ache in my chest. I had seen the fear in their eyes, the desperation in their voices. I had seen the darkness lurking beneath the surface, the cracks in their facade, I knew they were not what they seemed. I went to the window and stared out at the city below, the buildings towering above me, the streets filled with the rush of life. But the silence of the Johnson's apartment still haunted me. It was a silence that spoke volumes, a silence that contained secrets too dark to be spoken. The news said it was a tragic accident, a senseless act of violence, but I knew there was more to it, a truth hidden beneath the surface, a story that was just beginning to unfold. The walls of the building seemed to press in on me, the silence heavy, the echoes of the past still ringing in my ears. I knew I would never be able to forget what I had witnessed, the truth that had been revealed, 
the secrets that would forever remain unspoken, and the silence I knew would never truly be broken. Hello everyone, thank you for watching until the end, or listening, I guess listening would be a better way of describing it, um, thank you for everyone who supports this channel, I really am grateful, um, I like the comments I've had about my wife and her storytelling, um, her mic isn't the best, currently she's not with me, she's in a different country, so... Um, yeah, that probably explains the rain noises coming from her um, recordings. But I think they're quite a nice touch. I haven't seen her now in a few weeks, actually. So it's um, been quite difficult. But anyway, yeah. Thank you, guys. And it uh, means a lot to me. Please like the video before you leave to show your support. And subscribe if you are new here. As it really, really helps my channel. Here on this channel, we are an independent channel. We're not linked to any companies or youtube networks we don't sell any products or merchandise i don't ask for donations or anything like that and we don't use ai like some of these ai voice channels which we disagree with please support the real independent horror story channels there are a lot of fake ones out there run by automators and companies worth millions of pounds dollars or whatever you, currency um yeah we're a family run channel so i've been uploading every day for a long long time now and uh there's too many channels on youtube that are spamming uh stories using ai and it's kind of killed our views so i really ask please only listen to independent and real channels not just fake ones that some guru set up to make money it's important that you take note of this otherwise youtube and the internet and damn even the world in general is going to turn into some ai run soulless monotonous robotic number system with no passion uh no soul no nothing you know it's just, it'll just turn into numbers and success and money and points and i think by having humans narrate stories you add emotion you add soul energy and you can't get that from a computer, no matter how accurate it sounds. I'm sorry, you can't. Thank you to everyone. Hope you have a nice relaxing night or evening. Or hope your revision goes well for your tests. And I'll catch you guys tomorrow. Please tune in then. Thank you.